Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today is going to be a continuation of the plant review series, and there's a lot of people that want to see slightly more common houseplants. I don't know whether or not today's plant is now considered a common houseplant. It wasn't too much of a common houseplant quite a few years back, especially I think in the US where it took a while to come out. It was a bit more prevalent here in the UK and I would imagine Europe, but let me show you the plant we're going to be talking about. So today, <laughs> this is not very often that you're going to see me do one of these, we're going to be talking and we're going to be doing a review on a Calathea. So this is the Calathea mosaica, or the Calathea network is another word that, that people use to describe this plant. And yes, before you all say anything, there are crispy bits, there are dying leaves, it is not looking its best, but there might be a reason why this plant has survived for as long as it has in my collection. But before we get into the review, let's go into some ground rules. So if you're one of the people that is returning again to watch another one of the videos, welcome back. You know where you can jump to your favorite bit. And if you are new to my channel and new to this series, welcome to the slight insanity that is this review series. <laughs> now, as I always say in these, there is no way that these reviews are gonna be unbiased. It's my biased opinion towards my plant growing in my condition, which at the moment is in a conservatory in the UK and whatever that might mean, and the plant and the care that I give it specifically. And we'll talk a bit more about this in the review. Hopefully this review series will become a bit more of a repository where people can go and check out what it's maybe like for myself and anybody else in the comments. That's why I always encourage you, if you've got your own review, leave it down below. Give us as much information as you possibly can. What kind of what light is it getting? Is it getting any special humidity? Are you doing anything in terms of how you grow this plant, how you propagate this plant, all of these things, drop them down below. Any information, any, any and all information actually is useful if somebody's considering getting this plant. And as I mentioned, it's a bit more of a common house plant. So let's dive into the first topic. So I'll bring up the plant again and I will hold it for some of it and I'll insert some clips as well. I'll bring it in a bit closer so you might be able to see and I will try and get some close-ups of that leaf patterning. This is a leaf that has only just recently emerged and guess what? It's going crispy. However, the thing I will say is that in the conservatory, at least in the UK, at the time of filming this, we've just had about two weeks of temperatures being on average between kind of minus five Celsius to kind of one or two degrees. <laughs> so it's been cold and it's been a challenge and it's been expensive to try to heat up this conservatory so it doesn't drop below 15 degrees at night. And to be fair, it doesn't get much, it didn't get much higher than 15 degrees during the day. And if you've owned Calatheas for any number of time or years, you'll know, and at least that's been my experience, they tend to throw a bit of a hissy fit when it comes to the temperatures getting really low. Let's be real, Calatheas generally, in most people's experiences, don't need an awful lot to throw a hissy fit. However, this one is slightly different, at least it has been in my experience, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But how did I come by this specific plant? So it was one that kind of I became aware of when I was really first starting to get into house plants. It was a Calathea, so I was just like, okay, before I got it, I'm just like, oh, it's, it's gonna do the, um, the movement at night where the leaves go up in prayer and flop down. I'm not entirely convinced that this plant ever really did that. Um, I will also add a picture here of what this plant looked like when I first got it, and it was a tiny, tiny plug plant, and now, there was a lot of people that were looking for this. In the UK, at least, when I found it, it wasn't as in high demand. It just wasn't one that you saw very often because, let's be real, 
it's a green calathea, and most people tend to be gravitating towards calatheas and prayer plants for the ornate, the highly colourful things. This doesn't kind of fall into that category too much, but I did find it in a local, I want to say garden centre, it, it's a difficult one to describe. Um, it's a place, at least where I live, that's called Urban Jungle. <laughs> and it's a very interesting concept, probably not one of the first ones, there's a lot of businesses that have done this, but they had big colour polytunnels essentially where they grew some tropical plants in, they had like lakes and kind of like man-made little rivers with koi carp in it as well, they had all their tropical plants in there growing and they just stuck a kind of cafe slash restaurant in there where you can go and sit and be surrounded by essentially very large mature tropical plants as in you kind of in the middle of the jungle and where I live that's odd. Um, they do also have outs an outside bit with like garden kind of plants really, kind of more traditional plants that you would see outdoors. But yeah it was really interesting and the one little bit of a criticism that I will say when I went because I was just like oh I will go there and they will have all these amazing plants. I think they were leaning more into the cafe culture rather than the plant culture because the plants were there and you could buy some plants big and small and the prices were there but they had all the plants behind where somebody might have been sitting having coffee with their friend or their family. So it really wasn't conducive for shopping because I saw a couple of plants that I wanted to have a look at and maybe purchase but they were right behind, and that was the only place that they had them, but it was right behind somebody's table where they were sitting and having their coffee and a, a snack with a friend. And I'm just like, I don't want to have to excuse myself every time in somebody's table so I can have a look at a plant for something that I might buy. So uh, it wasn't great. Um, and to be fair, I think the last time I went after that, they'd moved more heavily towards the coffee culture. Yeah, some plants were somewhere in the back and they were being sold and they weren't anything exciting, but they were leaning heavily into the coffee culture, which I would imagine is probably where they were getting their profit. Wow, that was a tangent. But I <laughs> all of that to say that I did find this plant in a very small plug plant kind of way. Didn't have high hopes for it because I thought mm, it might survive, it might not. But considering that this might be one of the oldest plants in my collection, should tell you something. Um, but yeah, I think that's enough about the background, let's go into speed of growth. So the speed of growth for this plant is, well at least it has been in my experience, and as I said I've started it from a plug plant and I will say that kind of prayer plants and calatheas, tenanthes, dramanthes, all of these things that I started off from much smaller plants take a while to get to the level of a big pushy plant like you might be buying something that's mature in a plant store. And a lot of people might be looking at this plant and just kind of going, well I've seen calathea mosaicas being sold larger than this in plant stores now. Yes. Back then it wasn't that easy to find fully mature forms of this plant. If this holds true, and do let me know your experiences down below, if this is a relatively slow growing calathea for other people as well, let me know down below. And it's interesting because I wouldn't have assumed, because if you look at the leaves, yes there's a lot of sections that are not fully green because of that mosaic pattern, however this is possibly one of the most green calatheas that you're going to find on the market, as in it, from far away it almost looks entirely green. So I kind of assumed that this would grow faster than the really really ornate calatheas that don't have an awful lot of green on them and they've got a lot of other colours, but that wasn't necessarily the case. And yeah, I mean, if I was to benchmark this against maybe the Golden Pothos, in the growing season, because almost in the winter this does kind of go a bit dorm dormant for me, but in the winter, sorry, in the summer, <laughs> summer, in the growing season, with comparing this to the golden pothos, if the golden pothos will bring out two or three leaves, this might bring a month, this might bring out one, 
maybe two. But again, this book, my specific plants in the way that I'm growing it. And I'll talk a bit more about that in accessories and care. But also, this is an interesting one because a lot of people have asked me to show them some plants that are not growing in my conservatory. This has not always grown in high, high humidity. And sorry, I've just noticed there is a new leaf and I don't know whether or not it's gonna come up there. Ooh, yay. Can you see that little cigar-like structure? This is so difficult to film. That little cigar-like structure. I'll see if I can get some close-ups. That is a new leaf that's kind of unfurling. And I love calatheas for that, for the reason of how their leaves come out, because it looks like a little cigar that's coming out. Oh, really cool. This plant is a slow-growing calathea, for me at least. Moving into ease of propagation, and I think I've propagated this once, and I've only done the kind of the easiest route, which is by dividing the kind of rhizomes in the middle and getting a second plant out of it. I think I grew that out for a bit and then gifted it to a friend. But I mean, it was relatively straightforward. It was already in its soil mix. It went into an aroid soil mix because I learned quite early on that that is a better soil mix for most of my calatheas. And I've done a video on that up the top. I'll link there. But yeah, I mean, it wasn't particularly difficult. It took to rooting quite nicely. I haven't tried to propagate this in any other way. If you have and you've had success or not, do let us know in the comments down below. I'd be really curious to find out. But generally, not particularly difficult calathea to propagate. No more easy or difficult than most other calatheas. So if you have propagated a calathea, even if it's just by division, it's a very similar process with this one as well. So that being said, relatively easy. At least it has been in my experience. So coming into the availability for this plant, and it is one of these plants that there was a bit of an interesting arc that happened with this. Very similar to, maybe not to the same crazy levels as one of the previous reviews that I did, which was on the Raphidophora tetrasperma. It didn't go quite as crazy as that, because I think by that point people had already clocked that some calatheas are quite tricky and difficult to grow happily. This hasn't been in my experience, and that should tell you something. But yeah, this, as I said, it wasn't something that, and let me paint the picture here. So it was kind of available it's in the sense of, at least in Europe, I would imagine all the plant nurseries from the Netherlands would push out a batch of these every so often, basically. But there wasn't that many people that were aware of them. There wasn't probably that many people that were after them. And this is when the houseplant boom started, and I'm talking about the start, proper start of the houseplant boom again, which was before the pandemic, when people were starting to get into them. And I would imagine at that stage, there wasn't so much of a dedicated market and fanatics, like, <laughs> like all of us, out there looking for plants. So I would imagine the average person going into a plant store to maybe buy a gift of a plant for a friend or to buy something for the house and they were to see a very ornate calathea like the medallion or anything like that and then this next to it i would imagine the demand would be towards the more ornate thing because most people are very fascinated by very interesting looking plants because those other ones that are very colorful almost look like they're not real so i would imagine if this was sitting right next to it it would look like the poor relative However, if you were to take a closer look, and I keep bringing these leaves back in because however many years later, I still find that really fascinating. And anybody who's a scientist out there, I don't know if um, you might agree with me with this or if it's just me that made that connection, but if I bring that leaf back in, if you've ever done DNA sequencing, does this, does this, does this not look like when you're kind of I don't know, I don't even remember what the process was called now. It was so many years ago that I was studying sciences. But it does really look like when you were doing that DNA thing. <laughs> Very cool. It <laughs> speaks to the science geek within me. But yeah, it was it was a plant 
that kind of was there and I think it just grew in popularity and the nurseries in the Netherlands just kind of pushed out a bit more. They kind of saw that there was an interest and they pushed out more. So there wasn't as much of a peak and, and in demand of this because the availability was there. They probably just upped the production a bit. Yes, maybe the prices got a bit more pricey than would, what they would have been before people became aware of this plant. But I think, and I might, if I'm wrong, do correct me down below if you're from the States, but I think in America people really wanted this plant, but there wasn't that many of these around. So these at some point may have got quite expensive. This was one of the biggest kind of Costa farms, I think it was, that did a massive drop of this. And it was around the time, I think this was first, and then it was the ZZ Raven, <laughs> and I'm not gonna touch on the Thai constellation, but those kind of big releases that were done by Costa Farm. And I think this wasn't that cheap when it first came out in the States. I mean, it <laughs> probably wasn't getting prices up to the digits of some of the really, really, again, I hate using the word rare, but the kind of unicorn aroids like the philodendrons and some of the anthuriums. So I don't think it was ever that ridiculous of a price. And let's talk about price actually. So when I got this and the little plug plant that I got, I'm pretty sure it was single digits. I'm pretty sure it was high single digits, so maybe eight or nine pounds for a very small plant, which is a bit expensive because usually when you get those plug plants, especially of any other form of calathea, at least here, you're looking at maybe two or three pounds. So this was a bit more. Did I see bigger versions of this go for more? So kind of like low double digits, leaning ever so slightly, probably never quite reaching the mid double digits. Yes, I think. I don't know if in the States it got even more expensive than that until the Costa Farm push happened. And I also don't know if the Costa Farm push when it first happened was more expensive than that just because there was a demand for such a long time and people finally got their hands on this plant. But yeah, I mean, it's it's come down in price, I guess, a tiny bit. I mean, it wasn't that expensive here before. It's still not that expensive now. Do I see this that often anymore? Probably not. And I think this had its heyday. Has that heyday gone away? Maybe, which is a shame. Because again, a bit of a spoiler here. I rate this a lot more than I rate any other Calatha that I've ever had in my collection. Look at the title of the video. Look at how many years I have had this plant. So, meh. but yeah, I think that's all I wanted to touch really on availabilities. But yeah, do kind of let me know down below because I'm kind of aware of what was happening in the UK and the US a bit more because I was seeing people talking about this, but I don't know further across the world what the situation was or is or has been with this specific plant. But yeah, do let me know down below. And coming into pests with this one, and well, this is a very old, it's a very old um, spider mite predator. It's actual, I will deal with that later. And by old, I mean that's probably three years old. That should have been thrown away a very long time ago. But, and for the people that have been here for a while, this is a feral plant in my collection. You might be able to see by how junky it looks, but it is, uh, you do your thing, I'll come to you when I come to you. And it's a Calathea, and it's a feral plant, so that tells you something. But yeah, obviously it's a Calathea. <laughs> Spider bites. <laughs> Very simple. Have I ever had mealybugs on this? I don't think so. Have I had whitefly because of the coloration of the leaves? Yes. Did either one of those two things get out of control? No. So, but those are the only two pests really. I've never really had thrips on this or anything else really. Yeah, like, I mean, it's those two, by two I mean the, ironically enough, yes, spider mites, but the white fly was more of an issue than the occasional beanie bug on this. And it, again, the white fly didn't really do too much damage to the plant itself. My watering schedule may have done that and the weather, but... <laughs> But yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about pests. Let's go into the next topic.
Now, coming into accessories and care, and this might be a chunky topic as well, and I'll, I'll address a lot of the crispiness that you might be able to see at the bottom of the pot there. And let's go through some home truths. This plant got repotted into the very first... I don't even know if I did a soil mix for this. I think... <laughs> this is how early on it was in my collection. I think I just bought houseplant soil from a nursery or a plant shop and just repotted it when it got larger and that was it. And this has not had a repot since... Not since I first got it, because obviously I had it as a plug plant, but within the first year it was probably this size and it got up, up potted to this. It hasn't had a repot. Should I probably consider repotting it? Maybe. In my experience, most calatheas, and it's a shame because I've got one upstairs, and I have mentioned this on a couple of other videos, which is an underrated one, because it's very similar to the Stramanthi Trio Star. The Stramanthi Sanguini Trio Star, I think that's the full name. And it's the one called the Stramanthi Magic Star. It's got a lot less of the white and the pink and all of these things. But, interestingly enough, in my care, that one I found was much hardier than the Trio Star. The Trio Star has since died. That's still going. That plant is almost as old as this plant. Interestingly, in a move, and I'm going on a tiny bit of a tangent here, that specific plant, and I'll see if I can add a picture here as well of what it looks like now because it's looking a bit busted and janky again. It was really interesting because in the move, when I was moving all my plants to this house and it was a large collection coming over, there was a bit of a chat that was happening with a friend that was helping me move at that point kind of going, do you want this, is kind of like looking half dead. And it was like, it was on its last three really crispy leaves. And I'm just sitting there going, I've been meaning to throw that away for a while. I keep watering it. It's never going to get any better. But I did say, you know what? Let's try it. I'm going to chuck it in the bathroom. The house was a bomb site for months when the move and everything had happened. And I'm just like, if it survives, it survives. It gets to live another day, potentially. <laughs> and it's a shame, I don't think I've got pictures of when it had its glow up literally six months later where it just became huge and bushy and full and absolutely no problem. And it was getting to the point with that plant in the summer where I was getting to water it every two or three days because it was just using up the water that quickly. Unfortunately, because it was getting really root bound, I'm just like, I can't not repot you at this point. And as I said, most of my experiences when it comes to like repotting any form of Calathea, Stramanthi, all of these things, they tend to not really like it. And even if you just lift it out and put it into the new soil mix, they really do not like their roots being touched in any way or form. At least that has been in my experience. If it's been different for you, do let me know down below. But, so that was a very, very long tangent. Apologies. But the point I was trying to make is this one probably would do with the repot. Would I do that, having seen that happen again with that plant, and remembering every other time it's happened with my other calatheas? Probably not. Yes, it's crispy, but I think this specific leaf, looking at the size of it and looking at how low it is on the plant, may have been there since I first got it or grew slightly after I got it. So this has been there for years. Now, the other thing that you will see is the leaves do have this crinkling effect. Is this dry? kind of, but nothing major. This only gets watered and this is the least frequent that I ever water a plant. I think every 20 or 30 days this gets watered. I fill up with water there, I fill up the cash po as well, let it sit, pretty much drowning in water for about 10 minutes, lift it up, drain all the water out, put it back into this pot, put it in a corner which is right behind where I'm filming, which gets average light, kind of medium light maybe. It's kind of in the most bright spot in the conservatory in terms of the most amount of light, but because it's under a whole bunch of other plants and shelves and all these things, it doesn't really get that much light, doesn't get an awful lot of air movement. It's right next to the dehumidifier, Calathea, right next to the dehumidifier. And so, I mean, yes, there's crispiness on the leaves, but I'm also not going out of my way to not have the crispy leaves by doing things like rainwater or reverse osmosis water and all these things. 
It's still surviving. It's still pretty. I mean, as I said now, it's, it's probably more crispy now in the last couple of weeks because of that bad weather than it ever has been. It was, this plant is pretty, pretty kind of just does its own thing. The other thing I will say about this is for most of my calatheas, this is probably the most pest resistant one that I've got. It also has got really thick leaves for a calathea, which is probably why it's, in my experience, much more forgiving than any other calatheas that I've ever owned. And yeah, I'm trying to think what else with this one. It just, it, it works and it can be a feral plant and it can do its own thing and it will have minimal crisping even with all the conditions being against it. And I will say this has not only ever grown in my conservatory, this has also grown out in regular household humidity. In my other two properties that I lived before this one, this has this was there with me. Mm -hmm. It was getting very kind of average household humidity. I've never had it above a radiator, for instance, for it to get super, super dry. But I would maybe say that this plant out of all the calatheas might be the one that takes it the most. It has got very shiny kind of tough leaves at the top and underneath if you've ever felt one of these there is a very 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 fine kind of almost pubescence that slight hairiness that kind of slight velvety feel. Nothing major like you really need to kind of like feel one and just kind of go uh, maybe kind of maybe it's not it's not as smooth and as leathery as a top bit, definitely. It's kind of more of a, a textured feel underneath it, but no, it's neither here nor there. It doesn't do the, the movement at night, at least mine hasn't really ever done that properly. I'm not fussed. It does grow out as you would normally get with a little cigar thing. I do clear out some of the caterpillars when I can be bothered. But yeah, for a Calathea, relatively low maintenance. Shocking, I know. But let's move on to the final thoughts. So I put the plant down, so let's talk a bit more about my final thoughts about this specific plant. So I'll do the thing that I usually do, which is knowing what I know now, and if I didn't have this plant, would I get this? And it's interesting because for most of the prayer plants I have ever owned and some that I still own, my answer would be a resounding no to this question every single time. Even ones that haven't given me that much grief, they still give me more grief than most of my other plants, basically. So for that reason alone, I would be a hard pass. I'm just like, I've got enough stuff to be dealing with. I don't need to be dealing with prissy plants, basically, for lack of better words. This one would probably be the one that I would say, yes, I would get it again. I would get it in a small format again. I don't want it to get too, too big. And even with this one, I'm not going to repot it because I like it, but, uh, but yes, I would re-get this. And this is interesting because this is, again, a prayer plant, a calathea, essentially. So that should tell you something about kind of my next grading of this plant. So again, going into that score of 0, 1 being the worst, 10 being the best, at least for me, this would get a solid 6 or a 7. And I mean, that's probably about as high as I'm ever really going to go for a Calathea, and that's just my opinion on it. But for me, that's, that's a really strong score for a Calathea, because yes, it can get crispy leaves. Does it need, or has it ever got Reverse osmosis of distilled water? No. Does the crisping get particularly bad on this plant? Not massively so. Does it grow super fast? No, and that I'll take some points away from that. Is it showy? Depends on the person. For me, I quite like it. Again, I'm about that kind of like DNA sequencing thing. <laughs> I get the mosaic thing as well, I, I do. But yeah, just for me with the lines, and I'm just like, oh, wow. But yeah, I mean, this is a, good Calathea, at least in, in my opinion. And I've had discussions with different people either on here or on my Instagram as well. And I think everybody's worst experience, at least from what I can see, is the white fusion. <laughs> I still shed a tear for that plant because I think to this day, if I did come across it, 
I would probably turn it into a crispy mess like everybody else did. I have wanted that plant since I first saw it four or five years ago. And I know it's a lot easier to find in the States than it ever was over here. Have I got that plant ever? No. Will I go out of my way to buy that plant based on everybody's experience practically on this plant? Probably not. It is one of those plants that I think that one specifically, if it drops in price enough that it's under like two, two digits, I might get it and just in my head have it as this is the same as buying cut flowers. It won't last that. It'll probably last a bit longer. I'm not saying that. <laughs> it might last a bit longer than cut flowers, but probably not much longer than that, basically. So yeah. But yeah, the and I'll pick it up again. Sorry, I was just about to point at the table. You can't see the plant. I'll put it down so I can talk to you. Uh, definitely would repurchase good calathea, feral calathea. My experiences. I'd be really curious to see if it's just my experiences with this plant or if other people who have had this and other calatheas find this to be one of the easier ones. But yeah, do let me know down below. And yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.